the Old Testament. Ezekiel chapter 33. I'm going to read 11 verses there, and then I'm going to read one verse from Isaiah 58 um, for our text this afternoon. If you get that, please stand with me as we honor the reading of the Word of God. Ezekiel 33. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for a God. Thank you for some instructions in our life. Amen. Let's read Ezekiel 33, starting in verse 1. The prophet's writing here. He says, Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman. If when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people. Then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning. His blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. Verse 6, But if the watchmen see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, the people be not warned. If the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. This is God here speaking to the prophet Ezekiel. He says, Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. Pay attention to that one phrase there. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Therefore, O thou son of man, speak unto the house of Israel. Thus ye speak, saying, If our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we pine away in them, how should we then live? Last verse. Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? I turn to the prophet Isaiah, one verse in chapter 58, the first verse prophet declares this cry aloud spare not lift up thy voice like a trumpet show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sin let's pray dear heavenly father speak through our hearts change our lives transform us by the renewing of our mind the Holy Spirit take the word Penetrate our hearts. Quicken us by your Holy Spirit. Take the deep things of your word, O oh God, and put an awareness in us tonight of the time that is at hand before us. We'll give you praise, honor, and glory for it in Jesus' name. The church said, Amen. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. I'm going to ask you to keep your Bibles open tonight, if you will. We're going to be going through some different scriptures. One of my favorite authors, A.W. Tozier, stated this in one of his books. He said, Let every man abide in the calling wherein he is called. And his work will be sacred as the work of the ministry. It is not what a man does that determines whether his work is sacred or secular. It is why he does it. We're opening up 
in the Old Testament book of Ezekiel this evening, in the 33rd chapter. Of course, we're continuing, as you know, in the journey of the Old Testament seeking out Christ or a type of Christ or the gospel in some form throughout the Old Testament. What I'd like to do this evening maybe is a little different approach. With the help of the Lord is to take the thought of the gospel from the standpoint of the message and the job of faithfully proclaiming the message and doing it so completely without holding any of it back and without receiving any glory in the process. And this is not a message just for while it is for ministers uh, who consider themselves pastors or evangelists. But this is for us. We have a calling. We, each one of us have a calling. And we may never stand behind the pulpit. We may never... Uh, evangelize in a church for any period of time in a revival or a meeting, but we have a harvest out in front of us in our workplaces, in our schools, and in, in the marketplace, uh, uh, with our family and with our friends. We have a job and we have an opportunity, and that is to share the precious uh, uh, story of the gospel of the darling Son of God. And, and every opportunity, opportunity that we have that the Lord allows us we need to open our mouth and speak the oracles of God. But as we look at this, uh, and I want to say before we go any further or get too deep in this study, is that it's not the work of a pastor or a shepherd to say whatever seems relevant for the time or, or whatever seems non-controversial or whatever seems to be especially interesting to itching ears. We're, we weren't called to scratch ears or tickle ears. We were just called to declare the truth of the gospel and then to get out of the Lord's way and let him work. But our responsibility before God, and again, as I said and I disclaimed before, this, this is for us all. Uh, our responsibility before God and and for the sake of God's people is to declare what thus saith the Lord. It's to do only what we hear Paul uh, doing in Acts 20, 27, and that is declare the whole counsel of God. We're not to take away from the word. We're not to add to the word, but we're just to declare uh, what thus saith the Lord. But in the text, the word of the Lord comes to uh, Ezekiel, and he tells him to speak to the children of thy people. He says to tell them that a sword will come in the land. And that the people are to take and find a watchman to see dangers coming. To warn of those dangers uh, to the people when they come. And so when we look at what uh, the prophet's talking about here. What God's calling for in the land at that time. There's... Many in this hour who consider themselves watchmen to the people of God. There are many that are faithful. They, they carefully uh, look for signs that are coming on the earth. They, they're watching for the dangers that are around them. They notice that God's judgment is coming soon. And they faithfully warn the people of God. And those that are even outside of the kingdom. But the problem uh, that we're finding uh, even in this hour... Uh, there's many that consider themselves watchmen, uh, modern day watchmen. Their, their focus, though, is uh, on the present possibility of uh, getting some type of self-glorification more than the proclamation of God's truth. And this is a distortion of the calling that God put on Ezekiel here in the text. Uh, in the chapter that we're reading, God makes it clear that the man who has been called to be a watchman, to share what thus saith the Lord, uh, is responsible to obey God's commands concerning the souls of the people. But if we fail to share what we've heard from God, if we fail to open our mouth and disobey God and, and not declare the word of the Lord, the Bible says that we are going to be judged according to the sins that the people Commit. And I look ahead here at verse 6 where the Bible says, But if the watchman see the sword come, and he blows not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any 
person from among them. He is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. I look at warnings from God all throughout the Old Testament. I, I see the warnings from God like the one in this verse and, and read the context of the warning and it says a few things to me and I want to tell you what I see here. Uh, I, I, sometimes God uses uh, different circumstances in my life or uh, brings back to my memory just of everyday uh, tasks in my life and I, I've, I've noticed even uh, this week uh, on my job uh, sometimes when we're working on things, uh, we, we do a lot of demolition, we do a lot of brand new installs, and, and we're, when we're working on uncertain areas, areas that are kind of behind walls or uh, where we can't see things going on around us, uh, there could be dangers at any time. Uh, we had a gentleman when I was out last week uh, or this past week uh, that uh, without warning fell down in a hole and and uh, by the grace of God, it didn't kill him, but it, it bruised him up real bad. It punctured his hand, and uh, I, I, I would just pray for him today. But uh, there could be dangers around us at any time. But on this, we would be assigned on the job at what they'd call a watch. It was a person to warn of, you know, a possible danger that might be around us, and and they would give us a warning maybe if something was coming down the aisle before it would come. And many times, even the. Uh, uh, I'm sure Cecil would be able to relate uh, when, he, when he's hearing this that uh, welders would have what would be called a fire watch because of the intense heat around them and what would spark off the weld. Uh, and so this person, uh, they've got to pay close attention to everything going around them. But uh, concerning the text and, and what Ezekiel's writing about here, the person must pay close attention to who's around them for uh, uh, what could be going on around them. Just as uh, the, the worker, like on my job, uh, uh, and, and I'll again use the welder at, because it's a perfect example. He, he cannot see outside of his helmet. And the reason so is because his vision has been darkened and won't know if he's going to burn while working. And so in the same sense, the watchman, his duty is to be in the watchtower and, and on top of the wall and not to fall asleep. This not only puts those around him in danger, but it puts him in danger also. And I said all that to say this, is that the main job is to keep notice of the danger around us, meaning watching for the enemy, watching for the attack, watching for the danger. Therefore, the second danger in all this is people not being warned of danger coming. But then thirdly, there's another danger. Because of that, the worst that could ever happen is being convinced enough to believe that there is not a danger at all because no one told them that there was one. So therefore, verse 6 says that the sword would come and take any person from among them. What, what's so sad in all this? In the story, in the examples I've given so far, physically uh, versus spiritually, folks are suffering. They're unaware. They're having no time to respond. And then it becomes too late for them. Not enough time to repent when judgment is coming and to seek for mercy and, and, and what a dreadful thing it would be to be taken out of this world without any warning. We, we, we have the opportunity. We, we know the truth. But, but to see the warning and, and to not heed to it or not to be taken uh, uh, seriously and, and then snatched into hell and it's happening every day. People are going to hell. They're dying uh, uh, because no one had a sense of urgency to tell them any different. God says through the prophet Ezekiel, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. And I thought about this. I began to talk to myself, not in a scary way, but just kind of have conversation with myself. And I wrote down this question, because when it comes to this, there's such a great call, and there's such a great responsibility when it comes to souls. I work on a job for people's safety. I'm responsible for If I'm working in an area where I have live power, I have to tape an area off in red, which is very interesting once again. And that red tape, based on the 
the policy at my work says you cannot come inside the red tape. There is danger. It's live. It's a warning. And you're to see that warning and to not come past that line because your life depends on it. It's no different than this. We, we see white pages with red letters throughout the Gospels when Christ would speak his words on paper and, and he would give warnings of things to come. He'd say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And you can either take him at his word and be ready and be washed in the blood and waiting for the return of God or you cannot be ready. It's up to you to heed the word, warning and the words of the Lord. But they are there. They are tangible. They are visible. And they are there for your safety. And you heed to them or you don't heed to them. But I wonder do the watchmen that, that have been called but refuse the call that know better to be obedient. I wonder can these so-called preachers live with the fact of what their disobedience causes. I wonder if they'll be able to stand before God one day in their three-piece suits or their or, or their or their attire of uh, of whatever they built themselves up to be. I don't I don't know. I'm, I'm whatever. Can stand before God one day and even beneath them see the people that wanted to know that would have listened to truth had it been preached, burning in a devil's hell because they refused to be so self-absorbed and not share the truth. I'll tell you what's going to happen. They're going to wind up right there next with it. I wonder where the love is. There's no love there. There's no, there's no concern for a lost soul there. But he warns Ezekiel. He, he, he tells him to warn the people. He tells him, choose a watchman. He, te, he says, uh, blow the trumpet. He says, send out the warning. The job is about being alert. It's intentional care. You mean to do what you're doing. It, 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 there's no accident about it. It's not a false alarm. You see ahead of time the danger that lies in front of people. And then he sounds the alarm loud enough for all in danger to not just hear, but actually recognize the warning. I, I say all that, and, and I don't want to talk too much about me or my job, but the Lord just allowed by circumstance and by uh, experience to say these things tonight, and, and it becomes real personal with me because every Friday at work, and you can look Oh, you're, well, I can't wear a watch in there. I better not say that because somebody watches from work and they say, if I said I look at my watch, they'll turn me in. You can't wear a watch in the building. But if you got your phone out, when the, when the clock strikes 12 noon, there's a test that comes over the intercom. There's an announcement. It's followed by two alarms. And they are warnings. The warnings are for evacuation or for safety. One alarm says this is the sound for the seek shelter alert in case of a tornado on where to go inside the building and who to follow. The other is if, say, the building catches on fire, it's called the building evacuation alert, and they play them. They're two different sounds, but they're distinct sounds that if I heard them right now in my psyche, I would know, even though I'm not in the building of where I work, I would say, that sounds like the seek shelter alert. That sounds like the building evacuation alert. I have become familiar with it because of repetition. It's done every Friday at the same time, and some might ask, why do they do it every Friday? Why don't they just take you through a training when you start, let you hear it, and let that be the end of it? Why do they do it that way? Why? Because when the alarm sounds, they want everyone to recognize what the danger is and what to do and who to go to. And in verse 3, he says, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and he warns the people. By blowing the trumpet, it's a signal that's been agreed on. This is the sound. I can remember in 
2010, if y'all remember the tornadoes that come through Birmingham and went through Ringo, I was in a hotel in downtown Birmingham working. My wife, daughter, uh, I don't remember who, there were several people over at the house. I think Judy was outside calling for the tornado and everybody else had taken cover. They're in the basement, futon mattress on top of the kids. And I can hear through her phone an alarm. And I recognize that alarm because it's the same alarm I was hearing in downtown Birmingham as I stepped out of the lobby into the outside and they're trying to pull us all back in. And that 40 foot pole that's holding up the sign for the Marriott is doing this number. A pole that should not be moving back and forth because of its weight and its stature. And the siren was going off. Why? Because danger wasn't coming. Danger was upon us. Of course, we trusted God and He did keep us safe and God helped even the families today that still suffer that loss of that day. But the alarm would sound. Everybody recognized the alarm and they knew where to go and who to go to. And just like this, the signal was agreed on, meaning the familiar sound, because why? Why is it familiar? Because they heard it before. Because every Friday, I hear the warning alarm. Because uh, in that city that they live in, when storms would come, they hear the siren, and it was familiar to them because they had heard it before. And the enemy would be at hand in this time, but they would understand that the enemy was at hand or that danger was near. Why? Because they had heard it before, even warning them by the word of their mouth, and that day also by a trumpet, any time he could do it and when it was necessary, it would take place. And let me say to someone this afternoon, I feel this in my spirit this afternoon, everyone under the sound of my voice, one day when you stand before God in judgment, and we're all going to stand before the Lord, He will not judge you on what you did not know. He will judge you on what you did know. He judges you and calls out what was spoken before you. And when you uh, hear His voice, there will be no, I'm not sure if I remember that. Well, let me think a minute. Let me jog my memory, Lord. No, I can promise you when the voice of the great God of heaven speaks to you and the eyes of fire stare you down, you will remember every warning that was familiar to you that you refused to heed to. You will understand what's going on, but it will be too late to listen. It will be no time to remember and, and gather your thoughts. You'll be too late to respond uh, to the often repeated warnings. And they purposefully repeated them because the Holy Spirit wants everyone to recognize the danger that is coming, what to do when it comes, and who to run to. He said in verse number 4, and whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not the warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. And in the world today, the, the alarms uh, have been so quiet and silent in the church. Many do not mind or, or even notice them. They, they just kind of brush them off. I, I, I was talking to Brother Troy uh, at breakfast yesterday morning. I said, it just seems like we're talking about uh, sermons and, and preaching and, and preparing and praying and what kind of like the Lord sang in this hour. And it just seems kind of like when we would talk to each other, it was just very similar messages. And, and that's how the Lord works. When God, when we pray and, and ask the Lord, Lord, what do you want said in this hour? That's my my consistent prayer, Lord, what do you want said to the people each week? What do you want said to this nation each week? Lord, those that are listening, even in the surrounding areas, though they may not come to a church building, they're listening on the uh, the internet. Lord, what is the message for that hour? And we'll, we'll talk about these things. And, and Lord, what's the Lord speaking to you right now? And what have you been reading? And, the, and things like that. And we, we converse, but, but it seems as uh, though we, the same comments come out of our mouths yesterday of how we'll get up and we'll read a text and people disengage immediately because they're like, oh, I've heard that before. I, I know where the preacher's going with that. I, I've heard that sermon. I've, I've read that text. And, and then we just turn a deaf ear. And the Bible says in the last days that they will turn a deaf ear and they will they will turn to seducing spirits. They will, they will heap upon themselves teachers having itching ears and, and they will turn from the truth and turn to fables. 
And no doubt they sense there's an alarm coming up. But they don't see it as anything else but just the noise. They imagine that there's no real danger, or maybe they do believe that there is a threat of some kind, but they're sure in themselves, probably due to manipulation or a lie, that the enemy is at a great distance and there's plenty of time to find protection. Let me say to you, whether God comes or Jesus returns tonight, tomorrow night, next week, or three months, you don't have time. You better live like you don't have any time. You better live like you're not going to make it to your pillow tonight. Jesus said in Luke 13, verse 3, he says, I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall likewise perish. He didn't say unless you repent now at the altar call. He didn't say unless you repent before the end of the year. He didn't say unless you repent when you hear the right sermon that Makes you feel good. He said, unless you repent, why did he not put a time on it? Because we don't know if we have any. We don't know when Christ will return. And I know, listen, people don't want to hear hellfire and brimstone messages anymore. They don't like it. It's too rough. Preacher, it, uh, it, it, it's just... There's, there's no joy in that. There's no happiness in that. Well, as a pastor, I don't want to uh, face hellfire and brimstone for not preaching like a dying man to dying men. So I'm going to tell you the way it is. And if you don't like it, take it up with God. But the watchman on the walls must give a warning. He must speak of the judgment that is to come. He must declare that there is a glorious salvation found in Jesus Christ alone. Only God, as we talked about this morning, he, he must declare that, there, uh, 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 that there's a, a, a danger coming this way. He must do like the, uh, you remember the angelic heavenly host on the night of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Telling the shepherds about the coming of the Son of God, we must share the glad tidings that there can be peace on earth and goodwill to men. It is still possible, but it's not possible outside of the Lord Jesus. The unpopular news to a hellward world that there's only one Savior that many serve other gods. But the truth is, here's the good news. There's only one that saves, but he does still do it. And there's time to receive it. There's those in question. There's those with trust issues. There's those that have been taught wrong. There's those that have been taught lies. And for those, I, I, I'm so sorry that you had to sit under that. But I'll say this and I'll move on. Just as real as heaven is, hell is just as real. And if you don't serve the Lord, you'll go to hell. That's as simple as it is. I, I, I can't change it. I, 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 if I could make it any different for you, I would. But I'm not in charge. I didn't save you and I didn't create the world. So understand that. There's a heaven to be gained and a hell to shun, and you better do it. All this seems so harsh and hard to receive, but listen, there is hope. Verse 5 says, He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning. His blood shall be upon him, but he that taketh the warning shall deliver his soul. By an ear to hear the warning. One preparing for their own defense. They're allowing their souls to be delivered. They saved their life in doing so. Just by listening to the word and heeding to it. Not falling in the hands of the enemy. See, that's the thing. God is powerful enough to make you do anything he wants you to. But he loves you enough to let you do it on your own. So when you stand before him and you don't make it into heaven, it won't be his fault. It'll be yours. And then we find God speaking directly to the prophet Ezekiel, verse 7. I 
I'm trying to hurry. He says, So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. Notice that. I said as I read the text, notice that. Listen to what he says there. Let me read one more time. He's called Ezekiel now. He calls him son of man. He says, I've set thee as a watchman to the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. He did not say warn them for me. He said warn them from me. Isn't that interesting that one letter changed that whole word? Warn them from me. There's no major strategy here. The watchman does not gain his knowledge by studying the enemies surrounding him. He doesn't uh, gain anything by looking at the false prophets among God's people. And then, of course, this is the Old Testament. It would be even now. It's no different. Ezekiel heard from God that judgment was coming soon. And guess what? He obeyed and he announced it. That's what God's calling us to do. We, we think when God calls us to do something, oh, I got to get this done and I got to do that and I'm just not worthy and, and, and I don't, I'm not real good with grammar and, and, and you know, I'm too young so nobody's ever going to listen to me because of my, my, my youth and, 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 and or I'm too old and, and I, can rem I can, man, I'll tell you what, I, I can remember and I was, I was uh, talking to Brother Gladico about this yesterday. He knew Brother Lamb and we were in conversation about that. And, and at one time, I remember Brother Lamb looked at me and he said, you know, when he was asking me to take here, to take this position here, he said, I, I'm just getting to the point. Nobody wants to hear what I got to say anymore. I said, oh, let me tell you the truth. Everyone not only wants to hear what you got to say, but everyone needs to hear what you got to say. I said, when you're tired and you know you can't go another mile, then you tell me. I said, but I... My generation needs you, your wisdom to pour into me because we don't know what's coming in the days ahead. We need The best thing that we can do is to be teachable. When we become unteachable, we have become fools and ignorant. And when, then when, when Proverbs says that wisdom is the principal thing, that we are to gain wisdom and get an understanding, who do we get it from? For those that held the blood-stained banner of the cross of Jesus Christ, that, that kept the, uh, uh, the, the sword to the grindstone, that kept pressing on toward the mark of the high calling of God, going for that prize, that had experience, that had, had went through the fire and saw God step in the furnace with them. That's what we need in this hour. And we don't need a bunch of mumbo-jumbo, new age uh, mess preached to us, exalting man and everything else. We need a thus saith the Lord. People say we need revival. What kind of revival do we need? We need a revival of the Word in the church anymore because we've had enough of gimmicks. We've had enough of all this other garbage. We need red letters on the white pages for the ears that are deafened to hear once again. Ezekiel heard and he obeyed. He spoke. Did you know that's all God's calling you to do? Listen, obey, and speak. Not get all your ducks in a row. If you'll be obedient, God will help your ducks get in a row. If, if you'll be obedient, God will, God will fix all your mess. And what, what did he say? In the greatest sermon ever preached, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and what? His righteousness and all these things. But God, I don't know. But God, you don't oh, he understands it all. He just went looking for well. He ain't looking for perfect people. You, do you remember? I, I'm trying to finish, but do you remember the, the kingdom parable of the, the, the son and the, the king and he prepared the wedding feast for the son and they sent out invitations and, and to all their favorites and, and all they considered good. And, and guess what? They didn't show up. He said, so go out into the highways. And the hedges, and he said, and compel them to come, the good and the bad. Because God's looking for willing, not perfect. Just listen and obey. Obey the command. Verse 7, he says, 
I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word of my mouth and warn them from me. Because judgment is coming. Verse 8, when I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at thy hand. Listen, it's never promised. It's never promised to us that what God calls you to do will ever be easy. Nine years ago, if you'd asked me to step behind the pulpit and preach every week, I'd have said, you've done lost your mind. Because I, I, I can be social with people, but to step up here and, and, and not only try to preach a message, but then understand the responsibility of people's souls in the balance, I'd have said, no, there's more educated, more polished, more better, experienced men in the kingdom that can do this. Let me sit in the pew and just receive from God. But God don't want us sitting in the pew. That's why it's called a pew. Because if you sit there long enough, it'll start stinking. God wants you to get up and go out here and tell somebody that judgment's coming. That he's coming. He never promised it'd be easy, but it's possible. Why? Because God never calls you to a task without giving you the power and the ability to accomplish the task he sent you to do. This was the main message for Ezekiel, but guess who else it was a message for? Remember little Jeremiah? Young Jeremiah. Many times he tried not to speak anymore. And guess what? He found himself speaking. And listen, if we try hard enough, we can conjure up some type of excuse to try and figure out a way why we can't do what God asked us to do. Oh, we can come up with some good ones. Oh, Lord, well, it's too late. Well, Lord, I, I can't really read that well. Well, Lord, I, I can't, I, I, I don't know every scripture there is to know. Listen to what God told Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1, 3 verses, verse 7 through 9. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child. Hear this. For thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces. For I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And people were, I don't know what I'm going to say to them. Lord, I'm ready to go, but you get in front of them, you freeze. I don't know what I'm going to say to them. I can't quote 50 scriptures. I, 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 I can't, I can't uh, uh, do an exposition or expose scripture and explain it like uh, some of these guys can. Well, let me tell you something. It ain't your words. It's his words. And he'll touch you if you're willing to open your mouth and he'll put his words in your mouth. It's just, our job is just to do what God says without questioning. If we'll do that, he'll take care of the rest. Verse 9, nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. This is not the first time we've heard this. We, we hear it even in the New Testament as the Apostle Paul gives direction to his spiritual son, Timothy. 1 Timothy 4, 16, he says, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. That was for Timothy, but it's for every true minister. It's for everyone that God has called. That will share the gospel. But if we're willing to do that, we must constantly examine two great areas of concern. One's life and the doctrine of the Bible. We fail to do it for Timothy's sake and even for our sake. It's not just danger for you and me. It's danger for those that need to hear it. To all the ministers that God's trusted with this, with this blessed book, what a gift it is. It's not to be set upon the mantle of the bookshelf to collect dust like some trophy. It's to be open. It's to be read. It's to be eaten. The Bible says, seek out the book of the Lord and read it.
Don't ever let it be the case that someone sitting under your preaching or someone subject maybe to your care in your life ever be able to stand before God on the day of judgment and say, no one ever told me I needed a Savior. We find in the words of this verse 9 in this text that if the watchman faithfully delivered his message, then the response of the one he warned was the responsibility of the one who heard it. So you could say to the watchman, you've delivered your own soul. He said, verse 10, and I'm getting ready to close. Therefore, O thou son of man, speaking to the house of Israel, thus ye speak, saying, if our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we pine away in them, how should we then live? Verse 11, saying to them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? This is the fairness of God's judgments. Because the people are now asking the question, if our transgressions and, and, and our sins lie upon us and we pine away in them, how can we then live? Literally speaking in layman's terms, if our sins and and our transgressions, that those things are laid upon our lives. And, and we've got an answer for them because we're going to have to. And if the guilt of them is laid charge upon us, we can find no atonement for them. Even the punishment of them is going to be inflicted on us. And how do you just survive that kind of judgment when you don't survive that kind of judgment on your own? Let me say it this way. A world without the gospel is a world without hope. Paul said it this way, Romans 10. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? They must hear. Why? Because faith cometh by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. Hear me this afternoon in closing. God takes no special pleasure in the death of the wicked, he said. God's heart is for people to change the way that they think about him, to repent, to allow their thinking to be changed, to turn from their sinful way and live. God is not sadistic and cruel. God's not up there in heaven purposefully making repentance impossible because he loves to see humanity suffer. No. But I, I've got to tell you the truth. Before I sit down, the fact that God does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked does not mean that it will not happen. People are going to die and go to hell, folks. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. See, God's desire for humanity is that everybody repents. Everybody serves Him. Everybody makes it to heaven. Everybody turns to Him in time and be saved. But He will not spare justice. And He will not spare His holiness for those who refuse to turn to Him. He said in verse 11, Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will ye die, house of Israel? It says that the Lord is speaking 
in our hour, and we know he is. Turn from your evil ways. Because why on earth would you choose eternal death when eternal life is waiting on you to accept it? In our story, God wanted Israel to live and not die. But the question, why should you die, O house of Israel, means that they didn't have to perish when judgment came. And it's no different for us. We don't have to perish when judgment comes. Just as God told the children of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 19, he said, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. That I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and I see and heal you. Why did God say that? Well, one, because he loves, loves everybody. Why the warning from Ezekiel and the other prophets throughout the ages, even until today? Because of what he said to the children of Israel in Deuteronomy 39. He is saying to us today, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. That's right. You need to really pay attention to those words. If you didn't hear another word I said up until this point, he said, because I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. And someone may say, well, preacher, what does that really mean? Well, I'll tell you what it really means. It means that what I'm saying to us this afternoon is echoing into eternity right now this day. Heaven and earth are the witnesses recording today against us. So if you hear this word and, and, and you receive this word and you respond to God in repentance and accept him, that echoes into eternity. That decision to accept Christ is waiting for you in eternity one day. And if you turn away and you turn a deaf ear and you refuse to heed to the word of God and you refuse this gospel, the drawing of the spirit, the, the words and your response will be waiting on you on the day of judgment. So it all boils down to this, and we're going to pray. The question that God asked Israel in verse 11 is also being asked to us this day. Will you turn from your evil ways? Because if you don't, why would you allow yourself to die? Because if you don't turn to God, there's no road, there's no crown, there's no streets of gold. There's no gates of pearl. There's no walls of jasper. There's no eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ and the Father. There's eternal hell. And no hope. Please bow your heads with me. I'm not going to linger on this. Because there's really nothing else to be said. You've heard the gospel. For the lost person. Well, preacher, how do I know I'm lost? Have you found Jesus? Have you came to Jesus? When I say have you found Jesus, Jesus isn't lost. You are. If you're not living for him, you're lost. You're without God and you're without hope and you're without eternity. Without Jesus, you purchased a one-way ticket to death. And there's no way out of it except through him. So accept him right now as your Lord and Savior. How do I do that? As I read earlier, you'll confess with your mouth and believe your heart that the Lord Jesus is, is your Savior. He'll, he'll save you right now. He'll, he'll cleanse you. He'll He'll wipe your slate clean. He'll cleanse you by his blood. And you don't have to worry about perfection. You just need to be willing to live for him. He'll help you. He'll strengthen you. He gives you power to become a child of God. He'll, he'll work on you. He'll begin that work right now. And 
and he's faithful if you'll live for him to finish the work in you. You don't have to worry about getting it all together. As long as you're willing to live for him, he'll fix you. So come to him, will you? Come to him right now. In Jesus' name.